Hobgobbler Akazaz! Hi everyone, welcome back to the Art of Safe Scumming. I've been tinkering around with my Chaos Dwarves, which is, uh, in my opinion, my favorite Warhammer 3 DLC. I think that it was just absolutely excellently uh, executed from the get-go, and then the augments that they've added into it over uh, the last several updates have just made it, again, my favorite DLC. And uh, they play substantially different than everyone else in the game. But there have been some changes to the game since Thrones of Decay that have prompted some of you to ask questions. And I, I've received the same question at least twice, which is, all right, you go into this campaign and usually you start out with some kind of uh, non-aggression Hey everyone, welcome back to the art of Hey everyone, welcome back to the art of saves coming. Today we're talking about the Chaos Dwarves again. Now, I've been tinkering around with them a little bit and the Chaos Dwarves are just my favorite DLC for Warhammer 3 at this point. We'll see what happens with Omens uh, coming up here pretty soon, but I do really like the Chaos Dwarves DLC and they play substantially different than everybody else. Uh, in the game. There have been some changes in the recent updates, specifically Thrones of Decay, that have changed the Zatan cap campaign. I have a full campaign guide on Zatan the Black's start, and what would be considered probably the cushiest start of the Chaos Dwarves has actually become pretty volatile because of the introduction of Tamarcon. And the question uh, that I've received twice in the last week or so since my last video is, what do you do about the start position? Because it can be very grindy with Zatan. Because the thing that Zatan gets is that extra convoy and that extra uh, labor in intake that can really set off your campaign. But how do you deal with, for instance, the fact that you start with... Kolik as a non-aggression pack. So you can't like declare war on him. You really need the tech, uh, the uh, territory that he has in this area because you're kind of, you start out here, you're kind of sandwiched between Cathay, Village, Grimgore, uh, some more Chaos Dwarfs, some Greenskins, some Ogres here and here. And then not only Kolik, but Tamarcon up here. And with the addition of Tamarcon, the strat has changed a little bit, in my opinion, because almost always Tamarcon defeats Kolek. So the question is, what do you do about this? So what I've done here is uh, loaded up a fresh campaign just to give you an idea of what it looks like when you start if you've not done this one in a while. This is the lay of the land. So uh, I'm going to pop into one of my farther advanced campaigns that I've done recently, just kind of playing around. But first, I'm going to kind of show you the direction that you need to go in. So the, your first priority is going to be this faction here. You're, you're going to eliminate them. But you're going to split your army. You're going to recruit here. You're going to use the forces that you start with to take over these positions occupied by this faction. And you're doing that for the purposes of selling the Bloodwind Keep to Village in exchange for a defensive alliance. And you're going to keep that defensive alliance pretty much as long into the campaign as you possibly can. And I'll come back to that here in a second. From there, you're going to come over here and you're going to eliminate these green skins. You're then going to take the fight all the way to them and go down here to the Saber skins to take Saber Mountain. In doing this, go watch my guide. Using this settlement here, you can forge a defensive alliance with Kolek. Now, again, Kolek is going to be eliminated, but the purpose of getting that defensive alliance is to insulate you temporarily while you sort all this out 
and my previous guy said this was kind of optional. Now I say, take this position, sell it to Kolek for a defensive alliance so that when Grimgor does declare war on you, he's going to delay that a couple turns as long as you're healthy. You might even get to declare war on him after you've consolidated this province. And that is going to look something like this. You're going to go straight for raw materials in this province. Max raw materials out of this province. I prefer to go all the way up to tier 3 uh, for the outpost building, but only go up to tier 1 on the actual resource building uh, for the raw materials, because as you go up, this is diminishing returns. I think that you're better off to get more territories with level one uh, raw material buildings than to take these all the way up. Now, when you do your armaments buildings, I say the exact opposite, like this province over here, I've done two of these and they're producing max raw, um, excuse me, armaments. And uh, those ones we build tall. The, um, the strip mines we build broad. And then we fill the other spaces with things like control, because control helps out with your labor retention. Anyway, so you've taken this province. Now you target Grimgore. You get to declare war on him, or he's going to declare war on you around this time, and you should be able to get the jump on him. Once you've taken out Grimgor in this province here, you want to do this as early as possible, and then you're going to turn right back around, and by that time, one of these two factions has won, and almost always it's going to be Tamarcon. Tamarcon is probably going to be a little bit predisposed to go to war with you, you will have to get out of your alliance with Kolek if he is still alive. But basically, you should be able to just wait around and let Tamarkhan kill him. You're then going to take all of Tam Tamarkhan's territory all the way up to here. Set this up again as a uh, armaments producing province. And then this one as a raw material province. From there, the world is pretty much your oyster uh, you're probably going to have ogre problems, so you're probably going to go to war with the minor uh, ogre factions that occupy this region here and this region here, and then on to Greasis. And that war with Greasis, whenever you get into that war, is going to drag you all the way down to the coastline here because as soon as you make contact with Gorst, he's going to want to fight you as well. And if you're lucky, then he's already taken out uh, Kugat down here and you don't have to deal with him but just know that the player trap here is that once you get into a war with Greasis, it's going to drag you all the way down here and I was able to get into Cathay at will so they didn't declare war on me by taking this route now we mentioned early on that we wanted a defensive alliance with village one that pads you on the campaign map and it it gives other factions pause when you have a major ally like that. That's, again, why we took on Kolek at the beginning. Uh, but we kept Village, and the reason we've kept Village is if we come down here, all of my armies... Uh, I'm building this one, so that one isn't a good example. Same thing with that one. But it, it, it does have one indicator there, Chosen. This one's got four Chaos Warriors in it. This is a recent build, like I just recruited. You can see the fresh units here. Chaos Warriors. Chosen. Chosen Chaos Warriors. You see what I'm saying? So instead of relying on the armaments to be able to uh, get those new Chaos Dwarf units, which are fantastic, you can right from, like, turn five, start recruiting Chaos Warriors that are not going to be as good as the Hellforge upgraded, you know, Manufactory upgraded uh, Chaos Dwarf Warriors, but they're still way better than Hobgoblins. So using those early on to pad those armies, and you can see that I've progressed to turn 73. They're still in my armies. If you look here, uh, that's the wrong button, excuse me. If you look here, we don't really have that many. I've been spending my armaments 
on things like some of these Kadai, some of these war machines, a couple um, creatures, some missile units, but not a whole lot. And the frontline infantry has been predominantly villages allied recruitment. Now that we're at turn 73, if I were to go look at this, for instance, um, which actually that one's not, so we have to raise the Lord really quick. We have access to Chosen. Chosen with Halberds, Chaos Warriors, the, you know, the Marauders, Marauder Horsemen, Throwing Axes. But we also now have Chaos Knights and Dragon Ogres. These are going to crush these two units specifically are some of the best cav in the game. So these are arguably the best frontline infantry in the game between these two. You might say, well, the Chaos Manufactory uh, Chaos Dwarf units are going to be superior. Yes, they will. Uh, but these ones can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything in the game. And then these two units will crush any other cav in the game. So having access to these... And I got access to Chaos Knights probably like 20 turns ago. These are relatively early develop or yeah, recent development. But using these throughout your campaign helps pad those armies so that you can leverage those armaments to do other things, like building the buildings to get those hero caps up uh, in all your provinces and um, using it on artillery. The last thing that is really pertinent with Village is, let me find the army specifically that has it. Um, I think it might be over here. And this is, um, this will happen a couple times throughout your campaign. I did lose one of my other armies that had this happen to it. Spawnify. Village will spawnify your armies periodically. So if you have a... And an army that's got some room in it, you should always run around with another lord with some room in it that uh, will allow him to spawnify this army. And what that does is add three chaos spawn to your army for free, basically. You have to pay the upkeep on them, obviously, 188. Uh, but a barriered, unbreakable frontline unit that is that has magic attack, and I think it's got Sundering Armor. Yeah, Sundered Armor. Uh, that's pretty hard to come by for the Chaos Dwarves early in the campaign. I'm talking like turn 10, you get this. And I think uh, my other army was like turn 30 or something like that. Uh, and three free Chaos Spawn just in your army. So keep that in mind running around with some armies that have some space in it specifically to get Spawnified by Village. And it's very random on how he's going to do that. But usually by the first 10 or 15 turns, you have one army that's been Spawnified. And that is irrelevant of what else you've got in the army. Uh, this is not counted as allied recruitment. This is one of his changing of the ways. So you can have simultaneously the three chaos spawn and your four allied recruitment chaos warriors in your army. One last tip for your Chaos Dwarves, there are some traits that you want to farm. I have gone heavy into the paint on the uh, Exiled, and that gives you the uh, research rate. So if we go into my research rate, I'm up to 217 on my research rate. Um, predominantly because of recruiting that ca those characters and then just putting putting them in the disbanded pool but there are a few other traits that you should really look for the one that i don't have that i forgot to save when i did that initial load was the choleric and that one is a recruit rank plus for everyone faction wide and all it takes is to recruit that carrier uh, character disband him leave him in the uh, recruitment pool and then everybody gets a plus one recruitment so that's a really good trait save that one whenever you find it and then the other one is phlegmatic 
and it is really useful for like I have him usually hanging out over here at Ironstorm because usually when I'm down here I'm not going to have the ability to capture this settlement because they've usually taken it by then and you also don't want to prematurely declare war on any of the Cathayan factions. So it's best to just let Village's vassal have this position. And because of that, it's hard to maintain control in the region. So if we were to go into my, con my recruitment pool, control plus three. And remember, Chaos Dwarves do not suffer from supply lines. So they are a raw upkeep uh, race. So that means that you can regardless of if it's a lord or a hero you can put that character in here now the lord can be attacked and lost where the hero can't be but it's reasonable to just recruit say this guy is phlegmatic we recruit him currently in the province minus two if we put him into the thing minus one and then he would have that minus or that uh, plus three on top of it and that would bring us to a positive two on our control in the region so just by doing that and having those characters available for a very small amount of upkeep will allow you to pile um, control into a region to help maintain that uh, labor and then on top of it, there are a few things that you can attach to your characters. Um, let's see. It is this one. Control plus two. This would be a good one to put on that character as well. And just put them inside the settlement. There are a few others that increase the local um, in, uh, income and things like that. That Having a character in the area to help manage that, it, and my opinion, is very thematic because Chaos Dwarves are supposed to be slavers. So having an overlord in the region is all, not all that expensive for the Chaos Dwarves. So anyway, that's all I got for you guys on the changes when it comes to how you should conduct yourself in a Zatan campaign. But remember, this is all well and fun. You can do whatever you want. That's why this game is so awesome because it is a sandbox experience. You can do whatever the hell you want when it comes to that. But my suggestion would be to allow Colette to die and then take all of this land from Tamarcon and that will set you up for a world beater campaign uh, with Satan the Black. <laughs> Yeah!